Welcome to the NXT Podcast, your home for weekly NXT reviews and insight. The beautiful part of NXT is that when one dream ends, another dream begins. Find all of your NXT news, recaps, and analysis right here. So with that being said, we only have one question for you. Are you We thought so. Let's get the show started right now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the NXT podcast. My name is Zachary Smith with you once again for this week's episode of NXT. We had a good one. We've had good shows the last few weeks. And that certainly makes my job easier, certainly makes my job more fun when we have good shows to talk about. And certainly, this week is no exception. We're going to run that down in just a minute. As you know, we do go ahead and cover the news and notes going on in wrestling. And this one actually just came out the last couple days, so it's actually very fresh in my mind. Generally, with... Most businesses that are open, especially ones that are going to be open to any kind of public or it's any kind of entertainment, say, all elite wrestling, they use other wrestlers as members of the crowd. It helps make the show look better. It certainly helps the show sound better. It makes it infinitely better than a completely empty arena. And that's fine. If you're doing one of two or two of two things, those two things are proper protection, i.e. masks as they are recommended, or comprehensive testing so that you know who can be there and who cannot. That goes for the wrestlers in the ring and those that are outside as your crowd. So if you're going to have performers in a building together, you would think that you would want to have one or both of those things. And through a series of events, this week we found that WWE, unlike AEW, not particularly interested in those two things. We found out that WWE certainly is not interested in having the people in the crowd wear masks. From what we have heard, that's a Kevin Dunn thing and I imagine a Vince McMahon thing, where maybe it doesn't look good on TV to have a crowd wearing masks. And because it doesn't look good, that comes before all else. So you have a crowd that is not wearing masks. In place of that, I imagine that's why you've seen the hockey dividers in front of the crowd that in theory, should separate them from the wrestlers in the ring. Now, that would be fine, except, for example, when the Street Profits came out, I believe just a week ago, they came through the crowd. So you have the Street Profits not wearing masks coming through a crowd not wearing masks right next to them. Which, as you can imagine, is not exactly the guidelines for social distancing. Now, this would all be fine, right? WWE is testing the crowd before the shows start and before they're allowed in the building. If they don't pass testing, then they can't come in, right? We're good. That mm, See, that would be true, except, as it turns out, when WWE says people are tested, what they really mean is that their temperature is taken. And if your temperature is above a certain amount, then you cannot come in. Now, as we've all learned more about COVID in these months, you may know that having a fever is one of the symptoms of COVID-19, certainly. And that can be an indicator, as well as a cough, as well as not feeling well. Okay, those are indicators. However, that's not, A, the only indicator, and B, you can carry the virus without having symptoms. There are a lot of people that were asymptomatic, got tested, and then have the virus. So if you were to have the virus, 
you could feel perfectly fine. You can carry it for something like 10 days without it showing in any kind of symptom, which is why the testing itself is so important, especially if you insist on staying open as a business. And because the WWE was not actually doing testing, remember that they were quite happy to make fun of AEW for doing the rapid testing and saying that they were going to wait until more accurate testing was available. I would argue that any test would be more accurate than no test, but what do I know? And so they weren't particularly interested in it. I don't know if that's because of cost. I don't know if that's because of time. I don't know if that's because of effort. But whatever it was, they decided that it's not right for them to test everybody. Because that would just be so inconvenient, you know? Let's just get a forehead thermometer and just do it that way. And quite predictably, then, it was announced that... First, one of the Performance Center people that were in the crowd tested positive for COVID. So that would be bad enough that one has it, because as you may well know at this point, it's quite contagious. But it turns out that because that one person had COVID, now you certainly have to test just about everybody now, because this is highly contagious and you've been in a building together. And reports are coming out that there are several employees that now have tested positive. And so now you have a situation where they obviously have not released names of people that have tested positive, but here we are, and we have a bunch of positive tests. Now, that would be bad enough by itself, but just the other week on Raw... We had Christian coming back, and that was a show-long story with him. One of the people he spoke to backstage was Ric Flair. So Ric Flair, however old he is, was backstage, and then came out to the ring as well, and did a little bit of work in the ring. And then the next week was back at Raw, back at the Performance Center, and was cutting a promo with Randy and The Big Show. As you know, COVID can be especially nasty to the elderly. And so you've had Ric Flair there for a couple of weeks. And you've had this going on, and clearly you weren't doing testing. And I was talking about it last week, and it didn't make sense to me that AEW can do testing, but the biggest wrestling company in the world can't be bothered. And it's certainly one thing to take a temperature and put plexiglass or plastic dividers in front of talent. But if you're going to have them all in the crowd and not distance them as much as you should and not have them wear masks, I would think that you would at least want to be able to do tests so that you know that all of your performers are going to be safe. But in this case, it appears that they were not particularly interested in their performers being safe. They were more interested in their performers getting out there to continue the show. I understand this is a difficult time for everyone, and you're completely doing something new and flying by the seat of your pants. I can appreciate that to a degree. I cannot appreciate you putting everybody in that building at risk and having everyone risk getting sick when there are easy solutions like masks or tests, and then you don't want to use those solutions because you don't think it would be as good of a TV product. Because I think the bigger issue with the TV product would be if a bunch of your performers tested positive. Because if now Ric Flair or Randy Orton or Edge or Drew McIntyre or the Street Profits or Apollo Crews were now to test positive, that's going to put a damper on your show. Because now you've put them in a situation where they're out there every single week. And who knows what the distancing guidelines are backstage. I imagine there aren't many. Then you're putting everybody in that building at risk. And I don't care how big your business is. Your business is not worth putting people at risk and putting their lives 
in the hands of a disease that we know very little comparatively about. I don't care how much money it makes. I don't care how important it is to you. I don't care how long it's run without interruption. If you cannot properly ensure the safety of your athletes, then I'm not interested in you continuing it if you're not even going to put forth that effort. As it turns out, Roman Reigns was right, Kevin Owens was right, and Sami Zayn was right. All three of them at different points faced support, certainly, and then a little bit of confusion from some of fans. And Roman was wiped off TV, and Kevin Owens lost out on potential storyline opportunities, and Sami Zayn lost the Intercontinental title because they all felt that it would not be safe to come back. Roman for his family, Kevin for his, and Sammy for his. And as it turns out, all three of them were very right. And as it turns out, maybe they knew more about this than we did. Maybe they looked at a situation where your only protection once you walk into the performance center is that your temperature is taken, and then you know that everybody else's temperature is taken for a disease that does not always give you a fever. They all looked at it and said, you know what, I am good, thanks. And as it turns out, they all made the absolute right call. WWE is the biggest wrestling company in the world, as I mentioned, and there's a responsibility that comes with that. And some of the element of, this is unprecedented, we've never seen this before, is not good enough. AEW should not be doing a better job at keeping people safe and doing so immediately than you. Because AEW has done testing and because they have observed the guidelines, they were able to set guidelines very easily for if a wrestler is infected. So Renee Young tests positive, so John Moxley has to sit out for a bit. QT Marshall has to sit out for a bit. They're able to identify it very early, get that person out, and while it does suck that your AEW world champion John Moxley is out, it certainly sucks a lot less than if everyone got sick because John was still coming to work because he didn't have a fever. There's a certain point at which there has been enough time now that you know that you need masks or you need to do testing, if not both. And because you are the biggest wrestling company in the world, and because you fought so hard, bribed your way into continuing to run in Florida, and you've completely shifted everything to the Performance Center, you then have a responsibility to do so safely for everyone. Because at the end of the day, this is just a wrestling show. It is not worth anybody's life. Some people get COVID and essentially have the flu and are fine afterwards. Some people, not so much. And I don't think it's worth it to risk it just because you want to continue doing your TV show. And if you're going to continue to do your TV show, I don't particularly care what the cost is or what the effort is. If you're going to be responsible enough to run the wrestling show on television... You need to be able to protect the athletes that are already putting their bodies and health on the line without any kind of health insurance and any kind of assurance once that happens. WWE talks a lot about how it's a family and, oh, we're all just a family here. We know that that's not true. We know that that is a corporate slogan that they use in order to get around the fact that Really, it's just a bunch of men and women who are independent contractors who they will cut ties with as soon as anything really bad happens. But if you're going to have them out there breaking their bodies every week and not giving them any assurance that if they have to go to the hospital, they won't just come out of their pocket. And when they're old, they're going to have to pull a Mick Foley and crowdfund their own money for surgeries that they need based on putting their bodies on the line for your product then you at least have the responsibility, I would think, of keeping them safe. And I keep bringing up AEW because AEW is a very successful company from a very short time. And Tony Khan is a wealthy man. 
but AEW is not the biggest wrestling company in the world. Maybe it will be someday. There are days when I hope so. But because they are not the biggest wrestling company in the world, I don't find it clear at all why they are setting the bar in a lot of these areas. I don't understand why they figured out weeks and weeks before that you could just have some of the wrestlers in the crowd and it made a huge difference. And I don't understand why they were able to get the best out of Chris Jericho that he has been in years. I don't understand why they were presenting, frankly, a better television product for weeks before WWE borrowed some of what they're doing. And I certainly do not understand why AEW was more willing. Not that they found out, not that they did research, not that they were privy to information anybody wasn't, but they were just simply willing to do testing to keep their athletes safe. It very much comes across that AEW cares about the wrestlers and WWE does not. And I haven't seen much that makes me believe that anything is different about that. But enough of me on my soapbox about keeping people safe, you know? Let's watch some dudes and dudettes be unsafe for a bit and just take our mind off stuff. Let's do that, huh? We're talking about NXT from this week. Like I said, very good show. As we open up, we're cutting to outside the Performance Center. It says it's one hour before the show, and Cameron Grimes is running past the cameraman. And he's laughing. And he says, you might want to go check on Damian Priest. <clears throat> and they run over to, presumably, Damian Priest's car. Damian Priest is out the driver's side door. He's selling his back. And it looks like he was attacked. We're going to find out later that at one point his tires were cut and then coming out of the car he was attacked. And it looks like he hurt his back very badly. I'm not sure if it was just an extended attack by Cameron Grimes, but Damian Priest is hurt. And as we find out, Cameron Grimes was supposed to face Damian Priest, but for the moment he's out here by himself. And he comes out to the ring. And he's running his mouth and says that Damien Priest did it to himself. He said it first he slashes his own tires and now he hurt his own back trying to get out of this match. He said, I mean, I, pref I competed after he broke my jaw, but referee, come on out here and raise my hand because this is a forfeit. And as it happens, Priest does come out his back is is wrapped he's got the wrap around his uh, waist and he's holding his back and he gets into the ring he's followed by officials at first and then he he breaks away from them and gets in the ring and he's jumped by Grimes as he gets in the ring it occurs to me that this is obviously cementing the face turn for Damian Priest it helps build sympathy for him and gives him something to fight against and it's because Cameron Grimes is a is a smaller heel that you would do something like this it's just funny to me how you go from a face to a heel in wrestling not but a few weeks ago Damian Priest was the mysterious kidnapper and attacker of Finn Balor and this devious guy and then he finally fights Finn Balor and Finn beats him and that starts us down the road of you know what I like that Damian Priest guy it's always funny to me that you can do the most dastardly acts ever and then you just turn against a heel one time and everybody just kind of accepts that you're a good dude. And Damian Priest is really selling the back the whole time and he's selling it really well. You believe that he's really hurt out there. He's adjusting the way he works to that injury. Sometimes when people are supposed to be hurt they will forget to sell it the whole time and Damian Priest was selling it really well this whole time and as it turns out it's too much for Damian Priest to overcome and Cameron Grimes wins I'm still not super into Cameron Grimes I mean he's funny he's a good heel but uh, something's not connecting with me with him I don't know what it is I don't know if I just need more time with him. 
but it it just hasn't really connected with me. But he's doing interesting stuff the last few weeks, so that's always good. We cut back outside before the show where Rhea Ripley's being interviewed as she's coming in, and then she's interrupted by Robert Stone. He said, you attacking me hurt my body, but it also hurt my heart. He said, Aaliyah has officially signed with the Robert Stone brand. He said, I don't offer second chances. He said, but I got a golden ticket for you for a second chance. Jump on the hype train. And he starts doing the choo-choo. Rhea punches him in the stomach and throws him in a dumpster again. Which it's a good thing that they keep running into each other outside of a dumpster because this keeps a theme going. And Aaliyah comes out and she's yelling at Rhea. Aaliyah slaps Rhea, and then Rhea says, you've earned a golden ticket in my ring. So later tonight, it's going to be Aaliyah and Rhea Ripley with Robert Stone out, obviously, as well. We go and we cut to Thatch Thatch Can Wrestling. This is a fun segment they're doing each week. And he's doing much the same as he did last week. He has a half crab on one of the students. He's stretching him for a long time. He has, I forget if it was an arm breaker or what it was on another, and he's still stretching and really keeping it in, and this time the camera cuts to his face, and he's smiling as he cranks pressure more and more. He's talking about how you can take out a big guy real easily with these moves because look at how big his arm is, but there's no power in it. He's just you can cut anybody down easily. And he's really enjoying it this week more than he did last week. He has the trainees line up. He says, the most important thing is we all had fun. Now get out of my ring. I'm not sure how many of these we're going to get before Thatcher's back in the ring. They are very good. They're very enjoyable. It really gets across that Thatcher's just a nasty dude. There's a little bit of comedy in it, but a little bit of once he is back in the ring, that's going to be his style is kind of hard-hitting and submissions, and it's going to be something that he enjoys. So that's going to be fun to see him come back. I imagine we'll get a few more of these before we have Thatcher come back. I don't know what there is for him to do at the moment or who they want him with when he comes back, but we'll see. We cut again, and Undisputed Era is back in therapy with Kyle O'Reilly as the therapist. They're talking about Roderick Strong in that trunk, last week him running away. He said that he's finally spent a week by himself in his own head, and he said he thinks today he can conquer that fear of the truck. And the Disputed Era is very excited, and they have his back, and they walk back outside to the same place, and that limo, and Strong is finally able to get in the trunk, and they close it for a minute. They open the trunk back out, says Cole says, you conquered that. Good job, dude, and tonight you'll conquer Dexter Loomis in the ring. And Roderick Strong is saying, yeah, yeah, I, I, I will. And his face betrays the fact that he is still very scared of Dexter Loomis. And we get a video package for the main event. And that's going to be Keith Lee, Finn Balor, and Johnny Gargano for the NXT title. Or rather, the NXT North American title. The winner goes on on June 8th to face Adam Cole in, the, in a winner-take-all match. We start with Adam Cole saying he's the greatest champ in the history of this business. And he says, maybe after I beat Keith Lee, you can refer to me as champ champ. Keith Lee and Johnny interrupting. Johnny saying he's coming after the North American Championship. Finn interrupting. He says, when I take that title, I'm coming right for Adam Cole. This video package was great. It really set up every member of this match and really setting up... Keith Lee's kind of rise and his confidence. He says, you better not miss when you shoot for the king. Johnny going from Johnny wrestling and caring about the fans. And he says, the fans will support you on the rise up. But when you get to the top, everybody turns against you. And Finn Balor with his history says that I've been NXT champion and I've been universal champion. I've done everything except win the North American title. And it set up each guy gave you the reasons that they want to win and and could win and there's personal issues between all three of them which you need in a triple threat match like this and so we're excited for the main event 
before we get there, Karen Cross is out. And they're going through their entrance. Scarlet does a great crazy face as she's lip syncing to her uh, fallen prey in the ring. Uh, starts freaking out. It really gets across that something's not quite right with her. And then Bronson Reed is out next. I'm not sure why Karrion Cross wouldn't come out last. When you have an entrance like Karrion Cross, it's hard. It's hard to have him come out first because then whoever comes out second really just comes across as not as important. But you know that here we are. They say that when Cross was five, his dad would take him with him to the gym, and he would wake him up really early to take him to the gym with him. I think Mauro Ronaldo said that, and it occurs to me that that that's probably that's probably too young, right, to be at the gym. Feels like it doesn't feel like that'd be healthy for for healthy growth. But I, I don't know. I'm not like a trainer, but that just struck me as something that's probably not a good idea. And this is just a this is a big old hoss fight. This is two big dudes punching each other real hard, which is great. Always love that. Um, Bronson Reed doesn't give him quite as much as Champa did, but he gives him more than you would have thought. And Bronson Reed and Karrion Cross are going at it, and eventually Karrion Cross starts throwing Bronson Reed around. He locks in the cross jacket, and Bronson Reed taps out. And as they're celebrating, Cross starts tapping his wrist, indicating that time is almost up for whoever holds the NXT title. And then they cut to the back with Adam Cole, and the interviewer says, Who would you prefer to face? And Cole says, That's a great question. He says, The common man would probably say whoever's the easiest to beat, but I am not a common man. He says, My answer is whoever, because it truthfully doesn't matter. And as he's walking away, he says, Terrible question, because Adam Cole is great. He says, He's making sure my mantle has one, or has room for one more title. Our next match, Rhea Ripley's out first. And I'm starting to think Rhea Ripley's turning heel soon. Rhea Ripley's been a little bit more cocky than she has in the past. Uh, A little bit more aggressive than she has in the past. Losing the NXT title and then losing that triple threat match, I think, is kind of a catalyst. And then she's playing to the crowd a bit as she's walking down to the ring, but it's starting to come across a little bit like a heel where they want the crowd to adore them more than the crowd does. And this story is very much set up like she is a, a monster that that is terrorizing Aaliyah. There's nothing particularly heelish about what Aaliyah and Robert Stone are doing except that they're trying to be manager and partner with Rhea. And so this story makes me think that at some point Rhea's going to be going heel. She's starting to hit a little harder and a little nastier in the ring. I just keep your eyes open. And I think think I'm going to be right. I know eventually I'll be right. She'll go heel. But I think soon we're going to have heel Rhea Ripley. I'll be interested to see how that works out. Because I've only seen her really as a face in WWE. And so Aaliyah is out, and Robert Stone has a ruffled suit on. It's the same one he's been wearing. And Robert Stone's just great. He's he's great on social media, and he's great with the limited time and weird stuff that he has to do on TV. He's really making chicken salad out of this gimmick that I think a lot of people wouldn't have been able to. His hair's real messy. He's clearly barely holding it together. And they're going through, and this match is is very much just Aaliyah is scared of Rhea Ripley and doesn't particularly want to be in this match and is not nearly as strong as Rhea Ripley, but she keeps lucking her way into offense. She's outside, and Rhea goes to grab her, and Aaliyah screams, and because she's scared, she tries to jump off the apron, and it catches Rhea Ripley on the top rope, so she lucks her way into a move. It's an interesting way to do a match. It was fun. It's different. And Rhea Ripley is just overpowering her, and it's clear that it's not a competition at all. 
Rhea Ripley has submission locked in on Aaliyah, and Robert Stone jumps on the apron, takes off his shoe, chucks a shoe at Rhea Ripley. He has, he has a great aim. He th- seems like he threw it pretty hard and was right on target. Good job by him. And Rhea Ripley starts chasing Robert Stone, and Robert runs on his hands and knees through the ring. Rhea Ripley catches him and rips his jacket off. And Aaliyah tries to get a surprise roll-up on Rhea, but she's able to grab the top rope and catch it, and she can't get it. And then just riptide by Rhea Ripley for the win. And so Robert Stone and Aaliyah lost. And it wasn't particularly close, but it was a very entertaining match because of Robert Stone. So I imagine that Robert Stone can actually do a lot for Aaliyah. They never really had anything in the ring for Chelsea Green to do, except at the very end when she was in a tag match with Charlotte. Then she fired Robert Stone and then hasn't been on TV since. So I don't think that was a great decision to fire Robert Stone. And then Robert Stone was kind of in limbo. You didn't really see what else he was going to do because he didn't have clients now. And so that's kind of a a limbo that we were going to be stuck in. But as it happens, he connects with Aaliyah. And it's not a main event position, certainly. You're not going to have Aaliyah challenging for the NXT women's title anytime soon. But it gives Robert Stone something to do. And I think the more time he spends on TV, the better. And the more he's going to connect with the crowds. Because he's really good. And he's doing great work. And when you can give somebody limited time like that and they can knock it out of the park, those are the kinds of people I want to give more TV time to. Our next match, Dexter Loomis is out first. He's still super creepy. I still love it. This is probably the one gimmick that might have been helped by not having any fans. Because when they're doing segments with them and stuff, there's a little bit of a reaction by the Performance Center crowd, but not as much as there would have been for a crowd proper. And I think that that helps his whole aura, and that it kind of a, a hush falls on the crowd purposeful or not when he's out there and that really sells that he's just this super weird dude that you don't really know what to do with and he doesn't talk he just kind of has action speak for him and his art and his drawings but this I think this is the one gimmick that works better without fans I'll be interested to see how this works when we finally do have fans back so I'm not sure and uh, Roderick Strong is out next. He's with Bobby Fish. Bobby Fish is pushing him down to the ring, trying to convince him to go out. Strong tries to run to the back, but Fish catches him and corrals him, gets him to walk back down the ramp. Strong is yelling at Loomis to stop looking at him. And this match is great. This match doesn't have a single wrestling move in it, but it's great. This is an example of how you can tell a story with a match, and it can still be entertaining. A lot of times WWE will say that they're not looking for a great match, they're looking for a great story and looking for moments. And oftentimes, because you sacrifice the actual wrestling part of world wrestling entertainment, it ends up kind of falling on its face because it's not that entertaining. This did not have a single wrestling move. It's set up for a match next week, and it was very, very entertaining. This was one of my favorite things of the night. And again, it was a wrestling match with no wrestling moves. Dexter Loomis stands in the corner. He's staring at Roderick Strong. Roderick Strong gets in the ring, and he's trying to lock up or attack Dexter Loomis, but he can't get himself to go all the way over to the corner, and he keeps jumping out of the ring. And every time he does, three or four times, Bobby Fish will be like, come on, man, you got this. Come on, you got this. And Strong will jump back in the ring and try to do it. He'll try and dance around Loomis a little bit. Loomis does not move from the corner. He's just staring at Strong. And Strong keeps jumping out of the ring. He jumps out one last time. He says, I I can't do this, Bobby. He says, you're already here. You can do this. Strong tries one more time. He jumps out of the ring. And he says, forget it. And he walks to the back. And he's counted out. Loomis just stands in the ring staring at him. And Bobby Fish is standing by ringside looking out at where Bobby Fish... Or Bobby Fish is out there looking at where Roderick Strong walked out. And Karrion Cross locks. Karrion Cross, I'm nailing it today, huh? 
Dexter Loomis locks in a submission on Fish at ringside. And Fish is barely able to break out of it and runs to the back. And Dexter Loomis is now just at ringside staring at where they were. And this set up that Dexter Loomis is a force. It's set up that Roderick Strong is still really, really scared of Dexter Loomis, which he should be. He was kidnapped. And it's set up that there's still unfinished business here. You didn't have to beat anybody yet. You set up for another match. We find out at some point that there's going to be a strap match between Dexter Loomis and Roderick Strong. And we haven't seen that since The Fiend and Daniel Bryan. There's a big old leather strap, and one of your wrists is tied with it. The other one is tied to your opponent. So Roderick Strong next week can't run from Dexter Loomis. That's going to be great. This set everything up perfectly. It was a beautiful story. It was super entertaining to watch. It was funny, and it got both guys more over. And again, not a single wrestling move. That's pretty rare when you can set up everything perfectly like that. We cut backstage, and it's Robert Stone and Aaliyah talking to Regal on his iPad. Regal's just an iPad now. And Robert Stone says that we need a rematch with Rhea Ripley. And Regal says, no, you don't. Robert Stone is trying to convince him, and he says... We need, we really, we really need a rematch. And he's starting to, Regal's starting to agree with him. And Robert Stone says, but if we win, then Rhea Ripley has to join the Robert Stone brand. Because earlier Regal said, you know what? I agree. It will be Aaliyah and Robert Stone versus Rhea Ripley. And. Regal, at first, is hesitant to do this, and he says, I can't do that. But Rhea Ripley walks out from behind Robert Stone and says, no, no, I'm good with that. I'm good with all that. And so, presumably next week, it'll be Robert Stone and Aaliyah in a handicap match versus Rhea Ripley. If Rhea loses, she has to join the Robert Stone brand. Now, weirdly, I'm hoping that Rhea loses because Robert Stone is great, and he would help, I think, Rhea. I think he would help anybody. But I'm not sure if we're... You can either have Rhea just dispose of Aaliyah and Robert Stone, which uh, I don't love, or you can have Rhea lose because of shenanigans and have Rhea have to be a reluctant member of the Robert Stone brand, which I love and I think would be great on TV. It would give Rhea something to do because I don't think she's going to be in the title picture for a bit. I love Rhea being a part of Robert Stone brand completely reluctantly. It's announced that we're going to have a fatal four-way, I believe, next week with Mia Yim, Candice LeRae, Dakota Kai, and Tegan Knox, And the winner is going to be number one contender for Io Shirai's NXT Women's Championship. And it does a little one-sentence promo by each person with a video package talking about being the next NXT Women's Champion. This is unfortunate for whoever wins because Io's not losing yet, nor should she. Seems like it's going to be Candice LeRae that sneaks out with the win. Uh, Mia Yim and Tegan Knox are faces, so is Io Shirai, so I don't see that. So I would imagine it's going to either be Dakota Kai or Candice LeRae, and Candice LeRae just has more juice right now. Uh, Dakota isn't as on fire as Candice, I don't think. And so I think the better match would be Candice at the moment. I would love to see Dakota Kai, but I think I might be in the minority with that opinion. And here's our main event. Johnny's out first with his way worse than his original theme theme. Finn is out next. It's great to see him taken like seriously as a wrestler again, as opposed to his last bit on the main roster. And then Keith Lee, the North American Championship. And it occurs to me that he might not beat Adam Cole if he wins in a winner-take-all. Because uh, they're already setting up carrying Cross Adam Cole, so I don't know. But this dude is going to be Universal Champion or WWE Champion at some point. Like at, He's eventually just going to get called up, and he's going to be a big deal and a champion. It's the only time in recent memory that I can think of that having a brush with the main roster actually did a ton of positive for an NXT wrestler. So before Survivor Series, Keith Lee wasn't the person that he is now. 
and he wasn't presented the way he is now. But then at Survivor Series, he went toe-to-toe at the end with Seth Rollins and almost Roman Reigns, and really got him over. And since then on NXT, he's really been pushed as this incredible human and wrestler and monster. And it's because Vince McMahon really liked Keith Lee, and it kind of awoke maybe to Triple H what Keith Lee could really do. And it's that doesn't happen a lot with NXT wrestlers. And so Keith Lee's on a trajectory. And if Vince McMahon really likes him, then you know that's going to carry a lot of weight. But Keith Lee can talk. He sounds different. There's a presence about him. He's really good in the ring. I think dude's going to be WWE or Universal Champion before too terribly long. And we get a promo that next week is actually going to be the Great American Bash for NXT. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, self, that doesn't make sense. Why would just a random NXT be the Great American Bash? Why wouldn't it be a takeover? Uh, That's because uh, counter-programming is a thing. Uh, AEW has the second night of, is it Fighter Fest? I believe it's Fighter Fest. The second night of Fighter Fest, and because of that, WWE is trying to counter-program with the Great American Bash. That's the reason that we had a bunch of title matches. It's the reason that we've had counter-programming this whole time. It's the reason that the shift to Live on USA happened in the first place. For a company that treats AEW like a very small, inconsequential company, they sure do make a lot of business decisions based on AEW and what they're doing. Uh, And they usually lose in ratings, which is interesting. Uh, so that's, that's why it's, it's not, there's nothing particularly special that's going to happen on the show. Uh, it's just that they wanted to have something that seems like a big deal so that people have to watch. And so, I mean, that's, that's not going to work. Um, people aren't going to tune in just because, oh, it's the great American bash. I got to see it's people know that it's just going to be an episode of NXT. They know it's not a pay-per-view and, you have to have the right matches to, to set up to make people want to watch. People don't watch just because of the name outside of maybe WrestleMania and the Royal Rumble. Uh, maybe Survivor Series. Maybe SummerSlam, but definitely WrestleMania and the Royal Rumble. Uh, those are the only shows where you can really get away with just a big name pay-per-view doing viewers by itself. I don't think anybody's going to be tuning in just because it says Great American Bash. People tune into wrestling because there's stories going on that they really want to see. Or there's something like the Royal Rumble that's just crazy every year and really fun. Uh, So I think that this is just, this isn't going to affect ratings very much at all. I think if you had had like a stacked super card or you had had somebody coming down to NXT for the first time for one match, then that's one thing. But just, just having a fancy title on it. That's not going to do anything. So that's fine. Whatever. Um, This is a really great match between the three of them. Um, Johnny and Finn are are your your smaller, fast guys in this match. And Keith Lee keeps getting taken out on ringside. But when he does come into the ring, he's your big power guy. And he's he's throwing both these dudes around at the same time. It's really great. And you got to watch it. Toward the end... Keith Lee is trying to pin Johnny Gargano, and at the last minute he moves, and Finn hits the coup de gras on Johnny. Johnny rolls out of the ring, and Keith Lee hits the Big Bang catastrophe. Peep, peep the initials on that finisher. I'm amazed that WWE hasn't noticed those initials of Big Bang catastrophe, but they haven't. Nobody tell them. He hits that on Finn for the win, and so... Keith Lee retains the North American title, and on June 8th, it'll be Keith Lee and Adam Cole, the NXT and NXT North American champions, and winner takes all. The underlying thing is that Karrion Cross is kind of waiting in the wings for whoever wins that match. Makes me think Adam Cole's going to win because they've already set it up with Adam Cole, but Keith Lee also broke that hourglass backstage, so maybe we have something with Keith Lee, too. And so, Adam Cole comes out to the ring, and they're talking to each other, and Adam Cole raises the NXT title, and Keith Lee raises the North American title, and it'll be winner take all in two weeks. 
That also means that that is NXT for this week. Like I said, very good show. You had a few really good matches. I really loved the triple threat match at the end. I loved Dexter Loomis. And uh, Roderick Strong, I love that setup and the fact that they're going to have to have a strap match that makes logical sense, and it was really entertaining. It turns out you can do both. I loved that Keith Lee retained and that this feels like a big deal that him and Adam Cole are going to be going title for title. And this is the first time somebody will be the North American and the NXT champion at the same time. Adam Cole's had the NXT and North American titles separately. Keith Lee's only ever had the North American title. So, it'll be interesting to see how they do that, and if Karrion Cross challenges the winner, if he's challenging for both titles, or just one title, it'll be interesting to see. I don't know if they know yet. I love what's going on with Robert Stone and Aaliyah. I love that Robert Stone has another client, and that he's not getting main event clients, and he's not really respected by the main event, but people who need help, he's he's kind of latching on to, and he's doing some of his best work. I really hope that Rhea loses that match, because I love a reluctant stablemate. And I love that we're going to have that fatal four-way to determine a number one contender. It more or less makes sense who they put in that match. It's the four women who have been most prominent on WWE TV with Mia Yim, Candice LeRae, Dakota Kai, Tegan Knox. That checks out. If it had been a fatal five-way with Shotzi Blackheart, that would have kind of completed it, but I'm good with who they put in the match. And I'm excited to see what we get for next week. I believe next week is going to be the Great American Bash. There's nothing particularly special about that. Again, it's just a name for counter-programming, but I'll be watching and talking about it, so I hope it's a great show. But we'll have to see next week, and hopefully next week people are wearing masks or being tested or, you know, something, anything be fine probably. Just at some point before everybody in your company has COVID and you can't run shows because then you really won't be able to run shows. But that's going to just about do it for me this week. Now, if you want to find me on Twitter, I am Zach NXT. That's Z-A-C-H-N-X-T. We're always over there talking about wrestling and talking about everything going on and trying to be very outspoken about things that are going on that are terrible in the world and trying to ease your mind a little bit with some some fun wrestling stuff and joking around. You can find me over there. Again, Z-A-C-H-N-X-T over there. You can also submit any questions for the show, any comments, anything you'd like to hear me talk about, anything you'd like to see done differently. I'm open to whatever, and hell, your question might end up on the show. I've used a lot of questions that I've gotten from people on the show before as topics or topics at the end, something to that effect. But... Hit me up there. Follow me over there. Make sure you rate and review the show here on iTunes or your social or your listening platforms, rather. That helps a lot. In the meantime, with NXT over, that means my time is up as well. I've been Zachary Smith. You've been fantastic. Have a great one. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com and for all of these shows ad free head over to patreon.com slash wwe podcast until then we'll see you next time